I'm your host, Shane Newman. We're on episode 16 now. Uh, getting so deep into it, I can't even remember all the episodes we've done so far, but on this episode of the League Talk Podcast, we got current Texas Ranger pitcher, fellow lefty like myself from Royce City, Texas, Mr. Taylor Hearn. T. Hearn, man, what's going on, man? How you living? Man, I'm living good. I'm living good, man. Trying to stay safe during this pandemic and also trying to get my work in too. So, but uh, I've been good. Yeah, man, that's cool. We all trying to trying to stay safe during this pandemic. It's just been bizarre, you know. Over over half the year of 2020 has been. We we've had to walk on eggshells when you talk about the pandemic. Haven't been able to be ourselves uh, the way we knew we could be or the way we we're, we're used to being prior to to March or February of 2020, man. So. You know, I see you still healthy. You know, you, you you're doing your thing, and you're in the off season right now. So you say you're staying in shape and doing things like that. Um, I appreciate you jumping on the show, man. The League Talk podcast. You know, you have a young career at the big league level, but you're looking to play for many years. So we're gonna dive into all of those, all of those things, and um, and also your 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 youth career. You know, your amateur career, and, and to find out how Taylor Hearn made it to where he is now. But before we dive into that, man. Tell me this, you know, now, you know, the state of the state of the U.S. right now and things that are going on. Have you voted already or are you waiting? No, I did. Um, um, I actually voted the first day I got I got up at like uh, probably six, six thirty, six forty five. And the men in my church, me and my pastor and all the men in our church, we got up and voted yeah. in suits and everything. So like we, we did it the first day, just knock it out. And to be surprisingly like, you know, really wasn't that many like people out there they moved kind of smooth so that was kind of good for me because i'm like oh next time i vote like i'm just gonna do it the first day early. You know, get out the way <laughs> it's not that many people out there for sure <laughs> man i i can i can relate to that you know me and my lady we voted early too we voted the second day on the 14th i believe polls opened up for early voted on the 13th here in texas we uh we voted on the 14th and it was crazy we went to one spot and it was a line i'm talking about like a club line wrapped around the building and then we left and went to uh, Tarrant County Community College out in Fort Worth, the Fort Worth branch, one of the Fort Worth branches. And there was no way we walked in and voted and got up out of there. So, man, it's kind of cool. You voted you and the men in your church. I know you're strong in your faith. We're going to talk it, talk about that, too. But to get up and do that, take the initiative and do it early. So for everybody listening, if you haven't done it already, get out there and vote. You know, we, def- I, we definitely need the votes. Our votes count. We want our verse- voices to be heard. But other than that, man, let's talk about you, bro. Let's dive into to, to the young Taylor Hearn growing up in Royce City, Texas. Man, talk about talk about how you talk about growing up in Royce City first and foremost. I mean, I I found an interesting fact about you while I was looking up some things before the podcast, and we going I want to ask you about that, man. But talk about growing up in Royce City. Yeah, man. So uh, I grew up in uh, started living in Rockwall, and we moved to Royce City when I was in the seventh grade. And they've just been living out there ever since. Uh, you know, it's a small country town at the time, and still is a little bit. But uh, you know, it was a very small town. I mean, sh- I mean, man, I mean, we didn't even have a Walmart at the time, and then you know, a lot of stuff like a Bucky's and all that. So we didn't have any of that. So it was it was a it was a straight country town. You know, it was pretty peaceful. It was boring also, but you know what? That, that, that's kind of what you get in the country town. So, uh, but I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's a good mix of, of, of really, really good people that are there. You know, I got some of my closest friends I met in high school. Uh, and then there's some people back there I still communicate with as well, you know, but, uh, but no, I mean, it, it, it's a great town. Uh, I mean, it's on the map now because they got a 90 pump <laughs> lucky. So, hey, you know, I, I, every time I go over there, man, it's a, the first thing I go to is Bucky will get you at. Oh yeah, Bucky's is is amazing, man. Uh, to make a stop at a gas station, you can do grocery shopping. You can get uh, 
a, 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 a full course meal, all those things at Bucky's. But but they also on the map because Taylor Hearn is a big league pitcher that 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 graduated high school in Royce City. I thought you were born and raised in there, but you mentioned Rockwall. Um, born in born in Rockwall, living in Rockwall till you were in like seventh grade. But um, we know you're a baseball player. I know you played multiple sports, but what I didn't know, bro, is that you was a rodeo cowboy. So so let's share some light on rodeo cowboy because. You six six. They got you listed at two ten, but Taylor, you're not two ten. You're probably two twenty, two twenty five, something like that. But talk about man. Talk. Let's talk about the rodeo days because you did that for a long, long time. Let's talk about that first. Yeah, man. So uh, yeah, like like you said, you know, I did that for a long time. It's uh, it's some stuff I'm eventually get back into as well. Uh, but you know, that, I mean, dude, that was that was the first sport, <clears throat> first sport I ever did. Um, and honestly, one of the first sports I ever liked, liked doing, you know, when rodeo, baseball, football, basketball. So, uh, you know, it was something my grandpa did. And then, uh, it was just his, his four, his four son, my dad as well. And then, you know, with me being the first born grandchild and being a boy, you know, I kind of just got thrown right into it. So yeah. I was okay with it. You know, it, it was fun. But you know what, like, like now that I think about it and the reason why I'm so drawn to it is because it's such like a getaway from baseball, you know? So like that makes me even more like ready to get back into it and do it, especially like during the season, like in a time like this, you know, whenever I do have land or whatever it is, you know, it's always good to have that type of stuff, but that's like my getaway, you know? And that was yeah. something I, I'd like, like we used on the weekend whenever I had a, you know, just stressful day at school or just like, you know, I had a lot of baseball stuff. Like that was, that was kind of like my hobby. Gotcha. We all do as athletes. We all need that hobby or that getaway to take our minds off the day to day hustle and bustle or whatever it is we're doing as professionals, not only athletes, but as professionals in general, we need something. And for you, rodeo was that thing. And I guess, like you said, your grandfather, he made a lot of history as far as being a black male in, in the rodeo game. And then his sons, one of them, which was your dad, is your dad. They all did the rodeo. So it was kind of almost like the rodeo, the, the rodeo scene for, for y'all was like uh, a kid, like a, like a, let's say a Prince Fielder who grew up in a, in a major league clubhouse. You grew up, you grew up in the rodeo game. You grew up around the rodeo game. So you seen it all. So you had no choice almost, but to, but to kind of lock in and, and do that for some time. So that was your first sport. That's crazy. And you're a big league pitcher. So tell me this though, when did you start baseball? When did you start playing baseball? Cause I think you were four years old when you started, started competing in the rodeos, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I think I started competing when I was probably about seven or eight or so, but like, you know, and then I, I, I started playing baseball when I was four, started pitching and learning to pitch when I was about eight, seven or eight. So, uh, you know, it, it was pretty, it's pretty, pretty equivalent to both, but yeah, uh, yeah, started, you know, growing up with an outfielder and pitcher, uh, and then kind of shifted more towards when I got older in middle school, kind of shifted more towards pitching because, you know, I guess I kind of did figure it out and had people telling me that, you know, obviously, you know, when you're throwing harder, like, hey, you know, I got a good shot, you know. So it was uh, – baseball was always second, though. But now yeah. now baseball is first. And uh, ro rodeo's still up there as well, but I mean, right now it's just baseball. Hey, bro, that's crazy. I'm just tripping out. I mean, I've been knowing you for about four years, four plus years. I'm just tripping out on the fact that you were into rodeo. I never knew that the whole time. I knew about the family ties with rodeo with your grandfather, <clears throat> but I never knew you was that guy. I can't imagine you six six on. I don't know what what events you were doing, but I, I just can't imagine that. But it is what it is, man. Everybody has their thing, and. And you said growing up, that was number one for you. For me, basketball was number one, then baseball. But you did play basketball. You played football as well. Were those the sports that you played just because maybe my friends were playing it? Or, or what, what, what drew you towards basketball and football? Uh, more so about football was just – it was a family thing as well. Gotcha. Um, but also just like – my idols growing up were, were Michael Vick. I mean, I used to have, I, I had a red and a white, you know, Michael Vick. Being a lefty so too. I was, I was, yeah, being a lefty too. So, you know, he was, he was one of the reasons why I, I love playing football, you know? And, uh, and uh, he was one of the reasons that in basketball, basketball was a big Michael Finley fan as well, going to all the Maverick games and stuff. And uh, so th those are kind of the people that helped 
you know, drive me towards ba- ba- uh, basketball and football. But like, gotcha. man, it was just, it, it, it was fun, but it just wasn't like as fun as baseball. I'll say it like that. Gotcha. I wonder, I wonder what, what if Vic was your height, man, with all the, with all the skills that he had at quarterback? That would be that would be scary, yeah. man. <laughs> well, that that would have that would have been real scary. I mean, looking at, I mean, and to have his speed too. I mean, just imagine if Cam Newton ran a four three four. Exactly. You know, I mean, that would be scary. Yeah, that's bizarre, man. So you were an athlete, so you were busy all year round. Four sports when you add the rodeo into it: baseball, basketball, and football. And we speaking on you moving over to to Roy City around the seventh grade. What was the first sport to go? What was the first sport for you to say, hey, I'm done with this. I'm going to just concentrate on these and go from there. So when I got to high school, the first sport to go, when I was going into high school, first sport to go was basketball and football. So you canceled them and at the same time. You're like, I'm. Yeah. Yeah, it was them. And then it slowly started creeping up with rodeo as well. You know, I, I was like, you know, I had to kind of put a little bit more time into baseball and trying to fix stuff and trying to get stuff right. You know, but I still competed every now and then. I just didn't practice. So, yeah. I mean, it, it like, you know, base, like rodeo is one of the, you know, calf roping. It's one of the events and stuff that, that I did. So, uh, you know, that was one thing I could kind of, you know, couldn't really do as much. But when it was time to compete, it was one, something that I could always just pick up and do. But, uh, but yeah, so it was basketball and football. And then Rodeo followed after that. Gotcha. So you gave those up. Doesn't seem like you was tripping much at all. I think probably more than anything, it was tough to give up that Rodeo uh, because that, that was your first love. But let's talk about this. I mean, we know from the left side, you you up in up 90s have touched 100 quite a few times. You think that that calf roping and, and, and doing all of those things that strengthen those shoulder muscles and, and, and probably – I guess played a huge role in you being able to pitch with mm-hmm. high velocities in the baseball field. Well, I mean, I, I think the, the only like the weird thing about it is I did the events right-handed and then threw a left-handed. <laughs> so, uh, so come on, man. There was really no correlation for that. But I mean, I, man, I, I took I took a lot of stuff from rodeo, like just and I applied it to baseball. And then as I got older, I started realizing how much rodeo applied to baseball. You know, whether that's, that's from having short-term memory, that's to having, you know, always having that competitive edge and knowing that, you know, you can't take any days off because we'd be out there practicing early in the morning till late at night all day. So, I mean, that drive and everything was just always been there. And I think that was just because of my dad and, and also just him instilling that in me with the rodeo lifestyle. Yeah, that's crazy, man. You sound like me. I don't – I mean, I'll, I'll write, you know, eat, do a lot of stuff right-handed, but baseball, sports-wise – you know, I'm lefty. I'll shoot a basketball that way, throw a football, so on and so forth, hit from the left side. But we're diving into it, man, with Taylor Hearn, Texas Rangers left-handed pitcher. Um, you know, you're giving up the basketball, the football, and then you said rodeo came after that. You st- solely started to concentrate on baseball. When did you start to get that attention from the higher levels, whether it be college or pro scouts? Around what time in your baseball career did you start to get that attention? Uh, sophomore year. Okay. I had a couple of junior college offers and then, uh, I got the junior year at pro teams. And then that's when, uh, bigger D ones came out as well. And then my junior year I committed to university of Oklahoma. And then, you know, I mean, I had a lot of questionnaires and stuff like that going in my senior year was prepared for it, you know, and then I'm getting hurt. And then ended up didn't even pitch that my senior year. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was my sophomore year for sure. That's when things started going crazy. That's when I started throwing harder. And that's when stuff started, uh, you know, started to come together. Got you. Talk about that, though, man. Talk about that experience going through. You didn't have, I mean, around that time, that's when you start to see social media, uh, I guess, take, a, take flight when, when, when you talk about promoting ball players and stuff like that. But, for the most part, it wasn't as heavy as it is now. So when you started to get that attention, what 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 went through your mind? What what did you start thinking about? Did did was it overwhelming for you, or was it something that you was ready for? Talk about that for a little bit. It was definitely something I was ready for, um, but it was more so just me like 
having expectations on myself and thinking like, man, like, you know, if this is only just a little taste of it, like imagine if I kept putting in work, like what could happen in the future? Yeah. What could happen my senior year? What could happen, you know, when I do go to college, you know, I mean, I was kind of playing the guessing game, like, man, like, you know, I'm over here throwing 90, 91, like, you know, who could say in the next like two years, I'm throwing 96, 97. So uh, I would, I would say just, it motivated me more, more than anything. Cause when you start seeing all the letters, like, you know, I got a bulletin board full of uh, every letter I've ever got from professional people. <laughs> I always kept that as motivation. So yeah. I still have that. And I, I'm always keep that to always remind myself like, man, like, you know, like, you know, just a small things like that to help keep me motivated. Yeah. Positive motivation more than anything. And we all have that in some way or another. <clears throat> so we definitely need to, need to make sure we focus on the positive motivation so we can move forward because we're always going to have distractions. You know, the biggest thing is to stay on point, to stay on course, is spike. So you started, it wasn't overwhelming. Uh, you mentioned that, that you committed to OU uh, while still in high school, but you had that injury that prevented you from pitching your senior year. Did that, that was your first time pretty much having to sit out and not be able to play the game of baseball. Did that take a toll on you from the mental side or was it something that I know you have a strong faith was it something that your family and then along with your faith kept you positive and motivated that, Hey, I'm going to get healthy and I'll be back on track and, and on a field back in, in no time. So, so, so talk about going through that at such a young age, man, uh, going through a, an injury that's going to keep you out of playing the sport that you love your second love uh, for a substantial amount of time. Uh, yeah, man. So it, it, <clears throat> it weighed on me uh, pretty heavily mentally, like bad. You know, but I mean, like you said earlier about my faith and everything, like that was that was a pretty big part of it. But I really feel like my faith really got more tested my freshman year of college as well because I I, I got hurt again, and then I actually was close to quitting because I was just like, you know, this is the second time it's something different, and I'm just like, man, I just can't get the break. You know, if it wasn't for my mom keeping me grounded and telling me, you know, keep reading in your Bible, keep keep doing the right things, like you got to go through some hard stuff before you get to where you got to go. So definitely that. And then, you know, just having faith in God and always talking to him about it, but just, um, you know, just learning from a mental aspect, like learning how to be, just be patient. Cause I mean, you, you know, as well that guys want to try to get to get drafted, you know, as fast as they can. Guys want to try to get the big leagues as fast as they can, but nobody really wants to take the time during the process of getting hurt during the process of, just anything, the motion or whatever it is. I'm not really breaking it down and more so trying to figure out, okay, let me try to take the right necessary steps so I can move past this mentally and physically, but just so I don't have to repeat this. So definitely mentally, it took me up a notch, huge. Each, each time I got injured, even in high school <clears throat> to college, to pro ball, it like, took me up mentally because I kind of had to evaluate things from a different aspect and kind of had to take a step back from baseball and try to figure out, I, that's when I became more of a student of the game. You know, I started reading, reading, but also just watching more film of guys and breaking guys down to being like, okay, he pitches like this, you know, let me try to see what I can do to add that to my repertoire. I try to just let up my game every year, you know. That makes sense, man. I mean, I, I, I can definitely attest to going through that adverse time with having an injury. I got injured my freshman year in college. I uh, don't know how much I would have pitched as a freshman, but it was a good chance I would have had an opportunity to pitch as a freshman, but that setback kept me from doing so. Again, from this standpoint here, not, not ever having to sit down in your career and then all of a sudden you got to sit down for a long period of time. It's, it's tough on a youngster. You know, I'm sure you were about 16 or 17 at the time. I was 18 at the time it happened, so fairly young guys. And, and to have that strong family background, that strong belief in your faith, you know, standing in your Bible, all of that stuff kept you, kept you, uh, kept you above water. For me, I suffered, you know, my grades kind of dipped and things like that. Cause I wasn't able to do what I was always doing every summer, play baseball. But speaking on that, man, uh, having that injury, didn't get a chance to go to OU. Instead, you signed to go to San Jack. But before that you got drafted, you got drafted by the pirates, right? after your senior year in high school. Um, yeah. Was that something that you were considering? Were you considering signing that first time? Because you got drafted like four times or something like that 
uh, before you ended up signing with Washington a few years back. But talk about that first time you were drafted by the Pirates in 2012. Um, so, yeah, so like you said, I didn't pitch that year. So it, you know, I feel like as a high school kid, you got to, in order for you to go play professional baseball, it's got to be life changing money almost. Like it's got to be, you know, high six figures, not nothing like, you know, 100,000, 50,000, whatever it is. But, you know, guys, guys still make the Unless decision. you don't want to go to school. Unless you don't want to go to school. Right. right. And, and, and with me, I was okay with that because I was like, I'm, I'm going to be investing in myself and try to better myself so that I can set myself up for a situation to where I do get paid enough to, you know, be able to feel comfortable. But more so, more so about it was just, just the mental aspect. But then the physical aspect as well, because I was dealing with injuries, you know, getting drafted uh, three times prior before signing, you know, those teams were trying to sign you for a, a, a lower amount because I didn't have any innings. So that was kind of something they had on me. So I kind of wanted to get them back and more so put up good numbers and do well so I can say, okay, I am healthy. I can do this. Like now you have to make a hard decision to like, now, instead of you just projecting, like, okay, he's going to be like this. Like, no, I showed you I can do that. So, um, but yeah. But then also the biggest, biggest thing was also like, obviously I wasn't asking for like a million dollars and stuff like that. Close. But I needed, I needed, yeah, I needed, I needed some money so that it, it was an investment in me. But then it was kind of like where they had to invest in me as well. You know, because yeah. it's like, I see it as the more money you sign for, the better and more opportunity it buys you in pro ball to where if you sign for less, it doesn't buy you that much opportunity, you know? And I think you and I both seen it and can attest to that. We've seen guys that sign for $3 million or $2 million and they keep getting opportunity yeah. after opportunity. And then you That's see guys that sign for five. Yeah. You, but then you see guys that sign for like ten dollars or $15,000 or whatever it is. And they, they play him once every three days and then they go on a slump for about two months. And next thing you know, they're gone. Yeah. So that's real talk. Man. It's, 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 real talk. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's that type of stuff though. Oh, yeah. yeah. We see it every day, like you said, and then you see that diamond in the rough that might make it and that $3 million guy that, you know, might be at a baseball. But like you said, an organization invests X amount of dollars in you. That's giving you some type of security and know that you're going to get some a chance to, to show your talent and a chance to move the ranks and make it to the big leagues. Just like a cat has nine lives, you know, that money behind you gives you a set amount of lives when it comes to professional baseball. So, um, you know, dealing with that man, going to San Jack, pitching there, big time Juco. When you talk about Juco uh, baseball programs and then, and then getting drafted again after your sophomore year uh, at San Jack as well. And then going over to Oklahoma Baptist for a year, getting drafted again. And then I might be missing one. I'm not sure, but you finally signed. But before we jump into when you finally signed with the Nats, getting drafted in the fifth round, talk about because San Jack, they push out prospect after prospect every year. Talk about that experience going from Royce City, a small city out here in the DFW area, and then going over to San Jack, who was a who is still a big time JUCO powerhouse. Talk about how that prepared you for, for going to Oklahoma Baptist and then from there signing that pro contract. Um, it was a, it was a good experience, you know, but I, 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 I pitched two years. I was there, I pitched like 20, 23, 24 innings to deal with the injuries. And then there was a lot of stuff that also played into it as well. But I mean, I, I, I think just learning from San Jack, you know, those guys are great coaches, of course. Um, but, uh, dealing with injuries, that's where I really just learned my self-dedication and learn how to work out on my own. You know, I was doing my homework and then when I got done, about 7.38, I go lift out of, out of my uh, apartment complex, and I do that and go run and do anything to try to just stay active and stay ready, yeah. you know, and try to just figure out what was going on, to try to show people that, uh, you know, that we can, that I am a good draft prospect. So it was a, it was, it was a lot of stuff as well, but uh, I think it was just me also just uh, – you know, learning that self-dedication in college is learning that mom and dad aren't going to be there to push you. Trainers are not going to be there to push you. You got to be yourself. Yeah. Almost like a professional because you're away from home. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit more, I guess, I guess folks are, uh, 
it's hard for me to explain, but but it is like being a professional because you are away from home, as I mentioned. And it's up to you to go out there and put in the work because if you don't put in the work, then you're not going to have the opportunity. So I'm trying to keep up with the amount of times you got drafted, man. I kind of got lost because it is a lot. I don't know if somebody's been drafted more times than you or not, but four times. You know, that fourth time was a charm instead of the third. Uh, you're going to fifth round to Washington after putting together a, 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 a good season at Oklahoma Baptist. Let's talk about that process, man. Was it something that you was like, okay, I'm definitely signing, or did it take you a little time to make that decision? No, I, I, I was I was set and sold on signing that year because I had, you know, I had put up good numbers. I, I had shown the velocity. I had shown that I could be healthy the whole year. I showed what I can bring to the table, the type of pitcher I am, how powerful a pitcher I am, and just everything. And I kind of just was like, you know, it was a testament to me but then a testament to like other people I wanted to show as well that when I do make it to the major league and stuff like that, I want to be able to tell kids like it's okay to invest in yourself. Like you don't have to sit there and buy into a lot of stuff. Like that's what, you know, be okay with gambling on yourself. Cause I did, you know, I did it three times and then got drafted the fourth time and it paid off. Cause you know, I don't know, if you, but like you notice, like when you look at every round I've gotten drafted and like they got better and better. And then it got to yeah. the point to where you get drafted in the fifth round. And it's like, you, you know, nobody can turn that down. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. And it's, it's crazy just for that to happen so much, man. Like we talked about earlier, you went from the rodeo being your first love to like, okay, this guy has a real shot to be a major league baseball player. You know, you're throwing the ball in the high 90s, probably touching 100 in college from time to time. You know, you have the makeup, the shoulders, the height, you know, all the things that, that a scout will look for in a professional baseball player, a pitcher more specifically. You have you cr- you check all the boxes. You know, it's just a matter of you making sure you're able to stay healthy so that you can be on the field to perform at the high level that you know you can perform at to give yourself an opportunity to take it to the pro ranks. So you sign with Washington. This is what 2015. Uh, you sign with Washington, and, and let's let's speak on that first that first time. You stepped on a professional or even in a a professional clubhouse. Talk about that experience of being in a professional clubhouse for the first time and stepping onto the field and competing as a professional baseball player. Man, the first game I ever – the first – like, I don't consider rookie ball um, that yet, but it was when I went to short season. And I remember it to the day, you know, my first start was again was in Batavia in short season in New York. Terrible Finley. place. <laughs> so, yeah, man. So like it's like that was it, it doesn't get much much worse than that. <clears throat> so I remember I had like I think six seven strikeouts that game. I was pretty amped up, you know. I'm like, man, you know, I'm here in pro ball, like you know, I'm ready to do this, you know, ready to show these guys what I can do. But uh, it all just happened so fast. I just remember sitting back in my hotel and just thinking like, man, like, you know, <clears throat> I worked so hard to get to this point, but you know, now I'm in a better field with, I'm with guys that are, you know, I got two guys from one guy from LSU, Andrew Stevenson, and I got guys from Vanderbilt, I got guys from, you know, Clemson, all these other guys. And I'm just like, man, you're like, you know, I got, I got to try to hang with these guys. Yeah, you're so, uh, a little, little uh, Oklahoma I, I think, Baptist, little Oklahoma Baptist. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, NAI guy, you know, and you know for a fact, you know as well. Like when you know, when you when you look at the draft class, and you get to talking to guys and stuff like that. You have you have a tendency to like compare. You're like, wait, they took this guy in the 22nd round, they paid him how much? And like, you know, so like, look at me. I mean, I was a fifth rounder. I got taken in front of a, a bunch of guys that went to big D ones, you know? So it's like, I'm sure they said the same thing. Like, man, like why, why they take this guy from NAI? <laughs> like he better come by every throw on a hundred and stuff like that, you know? So yeah. like, uh, it, it, it was, it was good. It was good. You know, I made some really good friends, people I still communicate with to the day. And, uh, you know, it was fun. It was a good experience though. No doubt. No doubt. But Tavia, man, Michael Bowen, I had him on a few episodes back and he, he played with the Philly. So Batavia was his home. When he went to short scene, he was like, man, I'm, I told myself I'm never coming back to this place because it was a dump. So the New York Penn League, so I played in that New York Penn League as well. And Williamsport, the Pies used to be there. So um, it, was some, it was some places we went to that was, that was a little bit sketchy. So, But um, that, ex- that first experience, man, like you said, you saw a bunch of these big D1 guys 
on your team or you playing against these guys, you went to an NAIA school, all the kids listening, because we know nowadays everybody's pumping up, going to the big D ones, you know, pushing the PG tournaments, pushing this baseball factory, that all of this, all that, everything is that upper echelon. Yeah. Shoot for the stars, man. Shoot for the stars, man. You know, try to get to that highest level possible, but it's not the end all be all. We talking to a major league pitcher right now, Taylor Hearn, who went to an NAIA school, was a fifth round draft pick and is a current big league pitcher on the Texas Rangers, uh, on the Texas Rangers roster right now. So it, it doesn't, it, it, to some extent, it may matter where you go, but if you can ball, people are going to find you. So that, as far as that goes, that, that should be, that should be the moral of the story for anybody out there. Definitely shoot for the stars, you know, and, and see where it can take you. But, but don't let that be the end all be all for you. Don't put your eggs all in that one basket. You know, focus on the opportunity. Somebody that wants you, somebody that's going to give you that, the chance to show your talent. That's most important. So you finish that first season, man, or you finish that season um, in a, with, the, with the short season squad, with, with the Nats, and then you go to your first spring training. Did you spend any time at the spring training facility after the draft, or did they just ship you straight out to, uh, to short season? I spent probably about, about two, two or three weeks at the spring training facility, and then they shipped me out gotcha. short season. So they, uh, they wanted to make sure everything was good to go, you know, through a, through a game down there. Um, and then they're like, all right, yeah, you're good to go. And, Send me up to short season, but yeah, um, you know, I got a chance to, I was at the, when I was with the nationals, I was there when they had teal lockers and, you know, they're in Vieira, Florida, you know, and then before they got the new teal West Palm lockers, teal <laughs> and y'all were red and white. Yeah, they were. <laughs> yeah, I know. But yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was hot, man. Cause you know, that's Florida, and, you know, especially in that time and, and, you know, June, July, like Florida's hot. So it was, it was a different, different atmosphere. It was just a different ball game as well, because, you know, you're down there with a bunch of young guys, you know, I think, you know, the average age in rookie league is like what, 16, 17, 18 years old or something like yeah, that. Nobody it's, it's, it's really older than 19, probably. Yeah. You know, and, and so with me being a college guy, I kind of was like, man, like, you know, I'm going to try to just hold on. I'm not here too long. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I pitched in one game. And I'm just like sitting back thinking, I'm like, I don't need to be here. Like I like I just I just went through three innings and just threw predominantly fastballs and I was just like, I yeah. don't do that. You know? So uh but no, it, it was good though. It was good though. It was a good experience and uh, you know, kind of taught taught patience as well. Definitely, man. And then and uh, that first spring training, you know, you're around probably in short in, in rookie ball when you went there for the, that two week period. You probably saw about 50, 60 guys that were hanging around. And then you show up for spring training and next year is about 250 guys uh, roaming around the complex. Like, how was that? Was that like an eye opening experience for you to step on out there and see that it was a slew of guys out there in spring training competing for spots? Yeah, that's for sure. That's when that's when it kind of gets real. That's when you kind of gotta take it in, and it's also from like a business aspect as well, because you know you're seeing, I mean, guys that uh, came from University of Texas, and just or, or, you know, just just I'm talking about just guys in general that are in the upper level. So you know, like yeah. like these are guys I've heard about that are like top prospects, and I'm like, I'm over here sharing a locker room with this guy, you know, yeah. and it's like just double A, triple A guys, and some ex big leaguers you see in there. And so it kind of kind of gets a little realistic, but then you kind of got to put yourself in check a little bit because part of me was like, man, like you know, like this dude's a stud, and I'm like, man, I'd hate that the you know I got to compete with this guy for a spot yeah. eventually one day or something, you know. So that's when that's when kind of sets in. You're like, okay, like you know, four thirty forty guys early on. You're like, yeah, that's cool. But then when you see everybody there and you're seeing like <laughs> a different level, you are seeing guys that are throwing a hundred, you know, that went to this school, and you're like, man, I remember watching him on TV. You're just like, ah, oh, man, I gotta, I, I really gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta keep my job. Yeah, zone in, not get caught up in the hype. That's the biggest thing. You see all those guys, and, and if you avoid getting caught up in the hype, it allows you to focus on your task at hand and take care of business to do what you need to do in order to continue to climb that ladder and ultimately get to the big leagues. So, we all had that experience. You know, we all had that experience to see certain things go on in spring training. 
uh, you either you either early or you're late. You're never on time. So when, when it's time to be outside, if if it's a three o'clock stretch, you better get out there ten minutes before, fifteen minutes before, because now Taylor ain't ain't no running laps or or, or anything like that. They're taking money at your pocket. So so you definitely better make sure you're on, you you're taking care of business in every aspect of the game. Um, and from there, man, you know, you, 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 you get your first assignment after that going to, going to Lowe in Hagerstown. Um, that's where it was, right? Lowe was in Hagerstown for you, uh, 2016. I think that's when I met you right. late 2015. We will play, we'll play catch. You throw the ball the length of the football field, bro. I couldn't hang with you. I was trying to hang, but, <laughs> but I couldn't do that. You long tossing man, length of the football field, but I understand why everybody's different. Uh, I was definitely probably throwing about 70 yards or something like that. I couldn't hang with the, with the hundred, but um, you go over to Hagerstown, man, that first, that first assignment in low A. And then was it that same year you got traded or was it the following year you got traded to the Pirates? No, it was, it was, it was that same year, same year. Um, oh, geez, let me see. So I got hurt first game of the season in Hagerstown. First batter. Crazy. Rehab. I come back literally 30 days before trade deadline. And I start, they put me in the bullpen, start throwing well. And we go to Hickory to play the Rangers. Yeah. And we're about to play a double header. And my manager comes over to me, goes, Hey, uh, we're pushing you back today. So I'm like, All right. Like, okay. So everybody's wondering, like, Hey, like, why aren't you throwing? And I'm, I don't know. Like, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So we're in the dugout and it's, it was like the sixth inning, sixth or seventh inning. And the uh, manager comes down in and he calls me down. He goes, hey, uh, just thought I'd let you know that you got traded to the Pirates. And I was like, oh, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah. So you got to expect a phone call from the uh, farm director. So you got to go in the locker room. I'm doing this in the middle of a game. I'm running in the middle of a game. They got to call time and stuff. So yeah. I'm running. Everybody's like, what's going on? And it was crazy, man, because I remember I just walked right in the locker room and my phone's to the right <clears throat> and the TV's on in the corner. And it's like MLB Network. Sure enough, like 10 seconds in there. I'm Yeah, I, I see my name down at the bottom and then they start talking about it. And I haven't moved. And I'm just sitting there watching. <laughs> like, These fools are really talking about me. And then I look to my right and my phone just goes off. And it's just like, hey, congrats. Like, man, I just saw you on TV. I saw you got traded. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, what, is, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm just sitting there and I'm calling my agent at the time and I'm calling everybody and my family and let them know what happened. And so, uh, but yeah, man, it was, it was crazy. And then, you know, I mean, next thing you know, before the second game started, all my teammates, all my old teammates at the time, they were like, Hey, um, you want those shorts? You want those shirts? And I was like, yeah, dude, just, just take them. I was like, I don't care. Hey, so man, I, was like, I was like, I was like I was like, hey man, I was like, look, I don't, I don't play for him no more. So it, it is, I have, I have him, whatever. Yeah, it's a ball, you know. So we, we on the grind. It's, it's, we got to get it how we live, man. It's a tough, it's a tough goal. So yeah, them boys want them extra shorts, them extra t-shirts, all of that stuff. But you on the man, road, dude, so crazy. Yeah, you on the road. So how did that work out? Did you get a chance to go back to Hagerstown, or, or was like, hey, you gotta, you gotta be here, uh, wherever the Pirates? No, nah, so. The um, so they flew me to Pittsburgh and um, I'm thinking to myself, like, man, like how am I going to be able to get my clothes and everything out of Hagerstown? So they flew me from Hagerst from where we're at Hickory to uh, Pennsylvania to go get a physical. Yeah. And um, I'm up there and go talk to them and everything. And, and so I'm talking to our head trainer and I say, Hey, uh, where, where are you guys turning me? I'm thinking like back to low A, high A, I don't know. He looks at me and he goes, uh, Sydney is a Hagerstown. I said, well, I said, our team's in West Virginia, isn't it? They're like, yeah, but we're playing Hagerstown. So I'm just like, <laughs> okay. So I, I, I go through, I go to the park and, um, I'm just like thinking like, man, like, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Like I still got stuff in my locker from the other side. So I go to the locker room. Everybody's like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, shouldn't you be on the other side and stuff like that. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, look, man, I just came to get my stuff, and I was like, I'll be, I'll be on my way. So I literally had to get my stuff, I had to walk across my locker. Like there were the coaches' offices that were in between, 
And I had to walk in between the coaches' office to get to the other locker room. And so I'm sitting here and meeting these new guys. It's a lot of new faces and everything. I'm just like, man, like, you know, I'm trying to remember names. And so the manager uh, calls me in and he's like, uh, you know, hey, man, you know, I heard like good things about you, excited about you and all that. He goes, uh, how you feeling? I said, I feel good. I said, you know, I'm a little tired. It's like I haven't thrown in about two days. I said, but I'm good, though. And uh, he goes, okay, good, because he said, you're, you're going to be throwing it today. This is the first game of the series. I'm just like, oh, man, I got to sit here and throw against my own guys already. Let's go. So, yeah, so I was like, all right. So I'm in the bullpen, and it feels weird, and my whole family's in there. So I went to go stay with them and get all my clothes, and I'm taking, like, all my bags and everything with me on the bus and throwing everything under there. And when we're leaving, I'm just like, and but the thing is, though, we had a we 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 went to Hagerstown and we were gonna go somewhere else. So I had to carry my stuff with me for like to the next city. <laughs> yeah, so I need a chance to even go home or relax. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's my living arrangement gonna be like. And they're like, well, we'll put you in a hotel for about three or four days, and you know, you can figure out there. So I'm like, all right, cool. And I just remember this to the to the day we get back to West Virginia. We get to West Virginia probably about two thirty in the morning. I remember they dropped me off at the hotel. Say, man, I just, I lay down in my bed. I was tired, man. I was just like, man, this is just crazy. I'm like, these last like six days have been just nuts. Like I'm over here. I get traded. I go back to my, go back to where we are. And then I got to get all my stuff and I got to carry my stuff for another road trip. And then we get back to West Virginia and I got to, you know, I got to be in the field at, 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 at like one thirty for stretch. I'm just like, ah, man, like this is, I'm like, man, this yeah. is a trade <laughs> light. I'm like, dude, this is, it's crazy. Not only that, though, Taylor, not only that, that's the life of a minor leaguer, man. Yeah. Some yeah. some kids, some people don't understand or know what goes on. Just think about it. And, and we're going to talk about the big league career you've had thus far. It's a, it's an early one. You're early in your career. But regardless, you're responsible for your own stuff. It's like you're on the road. You might not get in until 2.30 in the morning. You got stretched the next day at a certain time. Sometimes you might leave the morning of to go to another city. You got a game that night. You might get to the to that city at one o'clock in the afternoon. You got to strap it up and be ready for BP at four or five o'clock and have that game at six or seven, whatever it may be. It's the grind of a minor leaguer. Only the strong survive. So you got to have it on your mind. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to put in the work that I need to put in to give myself the chance to become a big leaguer. So you started experiencing that early on with the trade, having to move around. It's just been a hustle bustle type situation. You carry your own bags, all of that stuff. So, you know, you start, you finally settle in with the Pirates, finish the year in, in, in low A in West Virginia. Talk about once you settled in, how did that look for you? How did that go for you the remainder of the season? I mean, technically there's only like 30 days left in the season. Cause you know, minor league season ends earlier than, than big leagues, but, uh, it was, it was just crazy because it was a lot that just happened. I'm over here learning new coaches and, you know, you know how it is when you get traded, you know, and no matter your position, like all the Rovers and everybody wants to come in and see you and oh, yeah, they gotta see. I'm over here trying to remember all. Yeah. So I'm over here trying to remember names and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking in my head, like, you know, okay, I remember you, I remember you and everything. And so I'm like, all right, like, you know, maybe this off season, I'm going to be a chill. Sure enough, I had to go to instructs. So then that's where I met <laughs> even more guys. And so, you know, their facility was awesome. I mean, some that, that was like that was one of the best gyms I probably Yeah, ever now, ever now. Used, ask right? me when I was yeah, with the now, Pirates. Yeah. Ask, ask me when I was with the Pirates. I yeah. looked over there. <laughs> very true, very true. But uh but yeah, man, like it was that year was just happened so crazy. And uh honestly, I felt like it was it was it's, it's a fresh start. I was like, hey, I'm on a new team. It's like I got drafted over again. They don't know me. I don't know any of them. I'm going to bring what I'm sure what I bring to the table, and we're going to work from there. Yeah, no doubt. And let me, let me, clear, let me just be clear. The, the, the clubhouse, the, the gym, the training room, all of that was nice. We're talking about the living arrangement, uh, our rooms. When I was with the Pirates, compared to what it is now, I, I, nah, Roach Motel, Rich Carlton. That's basically what it was. Roach Motel, Rich Carlton. That's where you were. You were in the Ritz. At the time, so but yeah, man, you know, being being part of that organization and 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 starting to settle in, like you said, meeting some people and getting to know the guys, and, and you go back the following spring, and you end up being able to stay in Florida, Florida State League, right, playing high A with the Pirates, 
Uh, talk about talk about that because you did suffer another injury. I think it was a foot injury this time, right? Uh, that that year when and no, I, I uh, tore my tore my oblique muscle. Okay, so different different body part. That injury, man, set you down for a while. And did you get traded that following year, or was it? No, it wasn't. It was the the year after that in Double A. But talk about that 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 first full season with the Pirates and how did that go for you? Man, it was uh, it was, it, was, it was crazy because the Florida State League is 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 not an easy league, and it's hot. <laughs> yeah, it's hot too, man. Because I remember I went to spring training that year at about two, about two twenty, two twenty five maybe. And by the time we got to July in the Florida State League, I was down like two ten, two fifteen, <laughs> because it was just so hot. You know, yeah. we get out there for BP at twelve o'clock and. You know, and it's 97, 98 degrees. And you're like, Jesus, man. Like, it's just, you know? So, uh, but then you run across guys like, you know, Ronald Acuna when he was coming through. Uh, I'm trying to remember. So there, there, there were some, there were, there were a bunch of guys that year. But uh, Florida State League, you know, brings the best out of you because that's where, you know, you're kind of, you're going to be facing dudes that are going to be in the big leagues and they're uh, just one step away from the big leagues, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it, it was a good challenge. It was fun, though. It was in Florida. I got a chance to go to the beach and all that, even though I really didn't go. But, you know, uh, I think that was the first time I got a chance to experience uh, playing in big league stadium, but with no fans almost. Yeah, yeah. Some high-level competition, like you said. And then you mentioned some of the bigger prospects that might be in high A. Guys are trying to make that push in the double A. You might have guys that come down from double A to high A that have that experience some salty veterans, if you would call them that, and things of that nature. So you handled yourself well, though. You had you put together a good season after coming back from the oblique. And then the following year, you go to double A, you know, you're hitting your stride. And I know we started really talking a lot because it was an adjustment for you um, from, the, from the sense of you didn't get off to the hottest start. You thought you didn't get off to the hottest start, but you were doing fairly well, but not to your standards. And then you was able to break through and put together put together a solid season and then get traded again uh, that year to the hometown Rangers. But but talk about a little bit, talk about a, just a just a tad bit about being in Altoona, which is a great, a great city as far as you know how they treat baseball in the stadium is is top notch. But that that double A experience, now you're amongst bigger prospects. Now you're amongst guys that have probably been in the big leagues already that go up and down from double A to the big leagues, you know, triple A guys coming down to double A. Talk about that first experience going into double A. Double A, double A was definitely a year um, playing in that level was the ultimate test. That was one of the first things that they told all of us the first year in double A. They said, double A, you're at the level now to where you're one phone call away from the big leagues. But basically, double A is the level that's going to show if you can play at the big league level or not. So um, I kind of took that to heart as well. But I just took it as another stepping stone as well. So uh, that was when I really, really started to take even more ownership of my own career. That was when I changed up my mechanics, changed up a lot of stuff to try to better myself. Because, you know, just like you said, I kind of felt like I got off to a bad start. And, um, you know, after three or four games, changed my mechanics took me like two or three weeks to fix it. And the next thing you know, it was just like, just it was rolling because, you know, you kind of got to make, you know, you kind of got to make adjustments on the fly up there. You know, you can't, you kind of got to find something that works for you. That's where you kind of find your routine is in double A. Cause you know, you're facing big league guys, you're facing uh, uh, future big league guys as well. But then you're also just, you know, just, you can just feel it up there. Like the level of competition is so different. Yeah. And then, you know, then when I went to Texas league, that was it was it showed like two different leagues almost. It was like patient hitters and stuff in the Eastern League and I come in the Texas League and these are I'm over here facing the Astros, I'm facing the Kansas City Royals. And, you know, the second first time I faced the Royals in uh, you know, Northwest Arkansas, I gave up three runs and in, in one inning. And uh it was like it was like twelve pitches in. And I'm just like, What like what just happened? Yeah, it happened fast, right? <laughs> you know, 'cause I'm like I'm like first pitch of the game, you know, base rip double or something like that. And the next guy could come up and it's like an out or whatever it is. And these guys are just like being aggressive. And I was like, man, is this league like that? And they come to find out it really was like every team was just like that. And I was like, man, you know, this just shows, 
how I need to continue to make adjustments and notice that and see that, you know, because I'm not, I'm not just Eastern League no more where guys are trying to work the count. You got to try to pitch these guys. Now it's more so like in the Texas League, like everybody's trying to get the ball up in there. Everybody's trying to hit it, hit it, hit early and try to get on me, you know, and then, um, you know, but it, like I said, it just goes to show that, hey, like you got to make an adjustment in Dublin. You got to be able to show that you belong there so that you can basically tell the organization that, hey, like I'm ready for AAA. And you call me out to the big leagues today, like I'll be ready. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely adjustments are key in AA from a pitching standpoint. If not, you're going to get your head knocked off more times than not. And you said you saw that in patient hitters in the Eastern League where, where they try to work counts. And then when you was traded over to the Rangers, getting a taste of the Texas league, guys are aggressive early. They're trying to get it, get it done early in the count. So it's almost like, hey, Eastern League, I got to make sure those type of teams, I got to make sure I'm able to throw, throw strikes early on in the count. I can't fall behind. You know, I can't fall behind. Texas League, I might have to pitch backwards a little bit more and, and start guys off with something different and then finish them with my fastball. It really just depends. But but you noticed that and you was able to make that adjustment. And, and that was important for you, not only performance-wise, below-wise, numbers, whatever, but if, t- if that, that team traded for you, the Rangers traded for you, they saw you was able to adjust from being in the Eastern League and the type of hitters you saw in the Eastern League and then coming over to the Texas League and seeing those type of hitters, you being able to change a game up or do something a little different to, to, to take care of business at that level is like, okay, like you said, he's ready for triple A, he's ready for the big league. So um, besides that, what else, what else played into to your mindset or, or your attitude, if I should say, when you, excuse me, when you got that call again, it was like, hey, Taylor, uh, we trade you over to the Texas Rangers. What 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 went through the head then? Were you excited about that because you were coming back home, basically, or was it like, oh, here we go again? Now I got to go get my clothes from here, there, and everywhere before <laughs> you know before I can really feel comfortable. Well, fortunate enough, um, we were at home and it was on the off day. We were actually traveling on the off day to go play here, so uh, I was fortunate enough. I didn't have to do nothing. I just had to, you know, basically pack up my stuff and they sent a guy to come pick up my truck and ship it down to Frisco. Uh, but, um, but yeah, man, that was a crazy day because, you know, um, I mean, I didn't get no sleep that day. I really didn't. I found that I got traded at two o'clock in the morning and, uh, it was for one of my, if it wasn't for my teammate, uh, you know, Stefan Allen used to, to wake me up, man. I wouldn't have, I would have found that in the morning on the way yeah. to the field. So, uh, you know, that was kind of crazy that, uh, you know, all that happened and transpired during that. But then, but then that just goes to show how baseball and how trade deals sometimes go further than 12 o'clock where people think, okay, well, it's getting kind of late. Like, we'll try again tomorrow. Like, no, they kept trying. They don't stop. Kept trying. <laughs> yeah, you know, like they were like, no, we're going to try to get deals done today. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was a lot. It, it was, it was, I was, I was very excited to be able to come back home. Cause yeah, I mean, how many big league guys can you say that, hey, I got a chance to make my debut with my hometown team. You know, yeah. not many guys can say that. I know I couldn't say it. Uh, there's no major league team. The closest one is uh, Houston for me. But man, the trades and you remain positive. The trades, the injuries, all those things could take a toll on you from a mental standpoint and a physical standpoint. When you talk, when you're talking about the injuries, that could ultimately affect your game in a negative manner. But you stay grounded again. We talk about your faith, your strong beliefs, your family background. I know all of those things kept you motivated, kept you in a positive mindset and, and, and focused on the task at hand because, like you said, you were knocking on the door to big leagues. You showed you can pitch at the double-A level and be successful. Now you're traded over once again to another organization and almost having to prove yourself again, stay positive, you know, you took that baton, you advanced it, proved that you can go ahead and pitch at a high level. Every trade you've been involved in was a big league trade, so we know what organizations, what teams thought about Taylor Hearn. They thought you were a big league pitcher. You just had to show it. So you go down there and you finish off the season. I went to your debut, your double-A debut. I remember watching you pitch. I think you, was, you got into the sixth inning. 
or something like that, or the seventh inning. They pitched real well. I know you was a little pissed off that they pulled you a little early. I saw the expressions when you got pulled out of the game, but you went out there and did what you were supposed to do. So you finish off, uh, you finish off the season. You go back the next year. I think did they put you on a forty man uh, going into the next season, or were you a non roster invite? No, nah, forty man. Gotcha. Had, to, had to protect me from the rule five. Exactly, and that's that 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 puts you in a comfortable situation because you can go out there and compete for a job. And I know last season in twenty nineteen. It was looking good for you, but uh, he's young. He doesn't have enough experience, blah, blah, blah. So you didn't make the team. You go over to AAA. You pitch well. You're doing well. And then you finally get that call up. But we know we had the conversation. You know, it was kind of up and down by how you were feeling, you know, with some things, you know, with the with the arm and stuff like that. You didn't feel like you were – maybe you wouldn't – didn't feel like the arm was where it needed to be at that point in the season. But you continue to push through. And you get that call up, man. Talk about the call up. Let's 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 just discuss the call up because you're rolling. You're starting to find your movement double A, despite not feeling like you would normally feel. But you're healthy and you're doing well. So you get the call. Uh, what time of night? What time of day was it? Who was the first person you called or text after that? Oh man! So we we're in Iowa about to uh, play the AAA team. And uh, I'm chilling in my lo- in my uh, hotel room, and I get a call from my trainer. He's like, "Hey, uh, you might come down da- coming down here a little earlier right now. Like, our you know, Woody, our manager want to talk to you." So I said, "Okay, yeah." So I'm on my way, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what what he wants to talk to. Yeah. Like, so um, I'm walking, get to the locker room, walk around the whole locker room, try to find my locker, and I'm like. I Nothing. can't put my stuff anywhere. I was like, all right, well, I was like, all right, well, I'll just set it here. Like, let me go see what he wants. So he come in there, and there are all the coaches are in there. I'm just like, What's release? Up? Am I getting released? <laughs> yeah, I was just like, I was like, I've only been here for like what, three or four weeks. I'm like, dang. <laughs> so, uh, um, he's standing there, and he's like, hey, how, how do you feel? So I feel fine. So I feel good. Like, you know, we had the off day yesterday and travel. I was like, I feel good, honestly. He was okay, sweet. He said, because uh, uh, you're getting called up. And I was like, oh, man, really? And, and you know, I was just <laughs> surreal. I didn't, know, I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know didn't, you didn't froze, know right? You froze. Yeah. And so all the coaches are in there congratulating me, and I'm just like, you know, was just shocked. So then um, he's like, hey, listen, like, you got to go. He's like, you got to go. He's like, either – such and such, such and such pitches today, you're going to pitch tomorrow. If he doesn't, then you're going to be pushed back another day. I said, okay, that's cool. So immediately I look to see what time the game is. And uh, I'm like, all right, so I got to watch. I mentally start to prepare. Yeah. So I, I get outside. First person I call is my dad. I put my dad, mom, and sister on three way, and I told them about it. And they, they start screaming and stuff. I said, hey, I got to go. <laughs> I just They just sent me Uber. I'm like, I got to go, like, right out. So they're screaming and everything, and I'm just like, I'm hustling, trying to get out. You know, I'm just like, man, like, because they kept telling me, like, hey, you got to go, you got to go, like, right now. Yeah. So uh, as time goes on, and I'm on my way to the airport, you know, I'm calling people, you know, trying to make sure I get to my flight, and I get there, like, an hour before. And I sit on the plane, and I'm just like, something ain't right. I was like, what? I was like, something ain't right. And they come to find out. I left. I left my uh, my bag at the field. <laughs> I left. I left my. Uh, I left all my gloves and everything. So I call our strength coach. He calls me. He goes, "Hey man, did you forget something?" I was like, "Yeah, I did." I was like, "Bro, I was like, can you just keep having to ship that to me over in Seattle?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm gonna try to overnight." So mentally, I'm just like, "Man, this is gonna be terrible." Like, I'm like, Dude, "This is gonna be crazy." Like, I'm over here. Like, I'm. I get to Seattle. I get in Seattle like late at night, and. uh, I'm just sitting there and I'm like thinking, I'm looking up Dick Sporting Goods Academy. I'm like, okay, I got to see what time they open. Find and glove. Get this spot, this spot. And I'm like calling I'm like, Hey, okay. What time did you say it was going to be here? What time? And I guess like, yeah, should be there before game time. So I said, all right. So honestly, what I was going to do, I was, I was going to ask like Joey Gallo or somebody else that were like a 14 or 15. I was going to yeah. try to squeeze in at their cleats just for the day. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was like, man, I really don't feel like going to Dick Sporting Goods. But fortunate enough, we got there on time and everything. So, like, uh, that, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was pretty. That's crazy. Man. Everybody has a story, man. And 
I know Rajay Day was saying, man, he wasn't even worried about his equipment. He was just going to the airport to make sure he didn't miss the flight. Yeah. So he just left it there. So you you fall into that category. You'd probably be using a true a true Shinsu glove uh, if you had to pitch that day, the outfielder uh, for the Rangers. But but that's kind of cool, man, to, to, to get that news. You walk in, you can't even put your, your equipment nowhere. You go in the office and everybody's standing in there thinking, oh, man, I'm about to get released already? You know, I've only been here for a month or so. What's going on? And then you get that, you get you get the news. Hey, you're going up to the big leagues. You're froze. You don't know what to do. You got to hustle and bustle. Call who you can. Get to the airport. I leave my bags. Dang, what I'm gonna do now? So, and we know, like you said, it, it's it's been paying off because you've been through a lot. Adversity had to grind. So to to step on that mound, you pitched in the big leagues in the spring in spring training, but now bright lights. The good baseballs, you on that perfectly manicured mound, that perfectly manicured field, and, and all that. You got the big league uniform on. You don't have the spring training jersey on. You got the real regular season jersey. All of that, man. Talk about talk about the time that you walked from the clubhouse to I don't know left field or right field line to start to warm up, and then bullpen mound, and then finally stepping on that game mound. Talk about how that how that feels. Man, it was it was it was, it was crazy because you uh, you're walking out there and you going through your routine and you're walking out there and it's like man, like you know this is crazy. You know you see all of these fans you, and it and you're like man, it's like I'm not in that I'm not in a, a, a minor league park anymore. Like I'm here in the big leagues. And, you know I'm I'm here in a retractable roof in Seattle. You know and I'm like it's my first time playing in one of these. So. Um, it was cool, man. I mean, I, I, I kind of, I kind of. One thing that I've had big league guys tell me, like before I made my debut, they say, "Hey, whenever you're on the mound, and you go in the stadium, don't look up, don't look around, <laughs> stay focused." And I was like, <laughs> "Okay," but I know me, and I know how I am, and knowing me, I'm like, I'm "Let like, me see." I look up, and I look, yeah, I look up, look around. I'm just like, "Why didn't they want me to look up and look around?" Like, don't, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it when you get on the mound. So I was like, "All right." <laughs> so you know, going through the warm ups and everything, you know, I was feeling okay. And uh, I get on the mound, I'm jogging out and going out there and get ready for my warm up pitches. I remember I lo- I did. I looked up, I looked around, and I was like, and I kind of just like sat there for a second. I was like, man, I can't believe I'm really here right now. And so I was, and then like in the back of my head, before I started walking around, I'm like, man, they don't know what they're talking about. No, no, don't look up, don't look around. <laughs> I, look up, I, don't look around. I was like, I was like, it's like they don't know me, like. I don't care about that stuff. Like, I don't sit there and be like, oh, my God. You know, like, yeah, I was like, oh, my God. But I was like, man, I got it on focus. I'm like, I'm here. Yeah. I'm ready to go. You know, so so it, it was it was a great experience, you know, you know, without the injury and everything. But, yeah. man, like, I wouldn't trade that for the world, dude, because, like, that's a story and something that, like, is always going to be able to stick with me. You know, but then that's a testament to other people that, like, when I tell this story – you know, that's like, he came up to me before I made my debut said, hey, would you rather have a bad debut and not make the Hall of Fame or have, or have a bad debut and make the Hall of Fame in the end? I'm like, oh, give me that Hall of Fame all the time. Yeah. But I, I more so wasn't scared about it. Like, yeah, it sucked, but I realized and I sat down, I realized like every injury, everything I went through helped prepare me for that to where it's like, oh, this is this, this is just another thing. Like, yeah, it happened on the biggest stage, but I really felt like that was just a test to God that he gave me to see if I'm going to continue to have faith. And he's like, man, like you went through all these injuries and you had a lot of good breaks. And he said, then all of a sudden, like, you know, you get hurt on your debut. You can't even, like you record one out. And then, and then like, you know, <clears throat> so I kind of took it from a, a, a positive aspect. Of course. You have to because because the journey doesn't end right there when you make your debut. It continues on the field and off the field. But unfortunately, like we like we like we just like you just mentioned, you know, you suffered an injury in your debut. You know, set you back. Um, especially the whole fact of the matter was we couldn't figure out what was going on. You know, you thought it was one thing, it ended up being something else. And then finally got to the root of the problem. 
whether or not I thought, and you probably thought you'd have been able to make it back that same year, but the fact that we wasn't able to get a clear diagnosis of what going was what was going on, it kept you out for the whole season. Probably not not such a bad thing in the grand scheme of things, but it had to be a little bit of a little bit of nerve wracking to you, nerve wracking to you, just to really not know what's going on inside that arm to to really tackle the rehab and get yourself back on the field. So just speak briefly on how, how that played on you mentally, not really knowing what was going on. Yeah, man. So like, you know, the first diagnosis was the strain grade one strain UCL. That's, you know, normal for pitchers to get that. And then I get back from that and I'm working way back and I'm just feeling like something's going on underneath my elbow. And I'm just like, man, I you know, I never felt this before. And then come to find out it was a stress fracture. Uh, no nerve damage, but it was, you know, had it, uh, had a basically be shut down for another two months or something, you know, whatever it was for the rest of the season. Right on the verge of coming back, so, right? Yeah. Like I was right. I was literally right on the verge to catch the last month of a minor league season and be able to jump and be ready for September. Yeah. I was going to throw, I was going to throw in two minor league games and then they were going to send me to triple A. But I, I, I couldn't even get to the game because of my velocity. Like velocity was, I couldn't get past 94. Everything was like 92, 92, 93, 94. And, you know, I talked to our doctor and he's like, that's not you. He's like, I know that's not you. He's like, you're, you're a 95, 98 type of guy. He goes, you're not a guy that sits low 90. Yeah. So, you know, he knew something was going on. But, uh, but yeah, man, just to sit there, go through those injuries. But the hardest, hardest thing was getting over that mental barrier because when I came back home to rehab, Mentally, I'm thinking like, "Hey, push your body. Come on, let's try to let's try to get past this hump." Like, you know, and I get past to like 120 feet and whatever it is, try to long toss. It took me a while to get over that because physically, mentally, I was there trying to get over it, but yeah. physically, my body's like scared, timid. It's like hold back. Like, are we? Are you sure? Because you know, we don't we don't know what's going to happen again. So that was that was probably the biggest biggest obstacle I had to get over was trying to get my body back to physically ready. And plus, you know, as well, like when you deal with injuries, it takes your body a long time to, 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 to kind of wake up and try to get used to what, you know, what's been going on. For sure. Going through that trauma, man, is, is definitely tough. But again, you, you've been through it pretty much your whole career, you know, dating back to the high school days. And, and so you knew what it was like, but it's still tough from the mental side of things to, to get over that, especially now you're in the big leagues and like, dang, I'm getting held back because of this. So you rehab, we, we, we had been in touch the whole time throughout and, and you're primed up for the 2020 season, you're going to spring training, feeling good, feeling strong, uh, team looking at you to, to be one of those guys to compete for that start for one of the spots in the rotation. And then boom, COVID, COVID-19 kind of throws a wrench in everybody's plans. Uh, you were tagging along, doing the things that you needed to do to prepare yourself for your first major league season. Uh, how did you how did you handle how did you handle the the COVID situation being shut down? Not because of injury, you back, you're feeling good, you're healthy, you're strong, and then and then the the the, the season or spring training comes to an abrupt end. How did you handle that part? Did you take some time off? Did you did you just keep working out, or what what went on with that? I didn't take any time off, man. I could I I because when we had our players meeting before we left, like all of the big league guys, all of our player reps basically told us that, Hey fellas, like you want to take some time off fine. If you, if you don't want to don't, but just know we don't want to hear anybody making excuses or trying to say, Oh, they weren't prepared because we could literally go home for COVID for a couple of weeks and be, they call and say, Hey, like we got to go. You know? So I, I, me personally, I just didn't want to because I was like, man, like I've, I've been through a lot and I was just like last year and I said, look, I, I'm, I'm not stopping. You know, I can't afford to stop. And so uh, it, it was hard and tough mentally because there was always these dates being thrown out to us. Like we have our meetings and stuff. Everybody's like, oh, hey, it's going to start here. It's going to start here. There's a good chance it's going to start here. Don't expect it here. And then, you know, then the rumors about, you know, well, we might not play this year. And then all of a sudden, then yeah. like a couple of days later now, it's like, hey, we got a set date. Like get ready, spring training, two weeks. Then they say a two week spring training. You're like, I've never done it before. So you're like, hey, you know, and you can tell it, you can feel it too. Cause 
that was by far like the quickest spring train I've ever had in my life because you felt like it was so tense because we were basically yeah. like, hey. It was like, a rush. You had to, uh, we got to get so, this thing yeah. going. Yeah, like, like, like show us what you got. Everybody's just showing them what they got. Like, and I mean, dude, like they're, we're a week into it, you know, about to come up on the next week and guys are just dropping, like just boom, like, hey, got to go, got to go, got to go, got to go, you know? So it's just like, it, it, was, it was crazy. Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, you know, a sense of urgency to, to get prepared for a season after being away from each other for however many weeks or a month or however long it was before, before guys got back together as a team, as an organization to get ready for the season. Um, it was a bit different. You had to go out there and do your thing, not get overwhelmed, you know, stay within yourself. And again, oh man, I don't know if you're ready experience, you know, you got shut down last year, blah, blah, blah. So what we want you to be a part of the taxi squad, keep yourself going kind of a bummer because you are on track to be on that opening day roster, if not for COVID-19. And then you go back thinking, okay, everything's still going according to plan. And then you get the news of Taylor, we're going we gonna to keep you back. And, and if we need you, we're going to bring you up. So I know, I know that that took a toll mentally, maybe just for a short period of time, but you kept, you kept focus on the task at hand and, and found yourself back up in the big leagues shortly after the season started. So you go back up there this time. It's not new to you. New stadium, probably one of the best stadiums in baseball. But you go up back, you go back up now, you've already had a taste, already already been under those lights. So talk about this year having to adjust to a different role of being in the bullpen. Although it was a short season, talk about talk about getting that call again and then really being able to settle in and be yourself, even though it's in a reliever's role. Well, I, I mean, I, I kind of look at it from like this, like people think when you receive a demotion at times, it's like the worst thing ever. Yeah. yeah it does suck at the time, but I think it's all about how you're going to approach it. How you, how are you going to have that mental aspect? How are you going to have a positive attitude about it? And that's something I did. I, I went down there and I was like, look, you know, I'm going to try to work on this, get this better and do whatever I can. So that when they do call, I'll be ready to go. Yeah. You know, and I knew for a fact, like, you know, I was like, man, I, I if, if I'm here for the whole year or whatever it is, like, yeah, it may suck, but I said, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get better at something. So, um, yeah, that, that was one thing that sucked. But then, like, I, I kind of think about it like this. It's better to make adjustments in the minor league than it is in the big leagues. It's easier to make, you know, mechanical stuff and whatever it is in the minor league than it is in the big leagues. Because in the big leagues, like, every game, is mad, every game matters. Minor yeah. leagues, you know, games don't really matter. It's about development, so like, development right, in my right, league. Right. So I took it like that. And so that, I mean, I was just like, all right, well, you know, what I got to work on, what I got to do physically, what I got to do mentally, I'm going to continue to get better at that so that when they do call me up, I'll be ready to go. Gotcha. And that's how it should be. But, you know, some guys, you know, I, I was one of those guys, you know, it, it takes an emotional toll if you get demoted or you get pissed off or – or you, you know, you get sad or go through whatever, if it was some type of depression. But again, you took advantage of the, of the opportunity and said, this is what I'm going to do with my time down there. If I get called up, I'll be ready. I'll be able to take care of business. If I don't get called up, I'm going to continue to get better at something, which is great, a great mindset to have in that situation, not only for yourself, but from an organizational standpoint. Now they know Taylor's a real professional because he's going about his business the way he should. And, and, and not causing any trouble or, or any, any, other, any other, I guess, negative type of feedback because we decided to send him down to the minor leagues instead of keeping him on the big league squad. So that's a, definitely a testament to you, you know, being strong-minded, having a strong faith, having a good family background to keep you focused on a task at hand in order to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. But Man, we got a couple more minutes, Taylor, man, and I definitely appreciate you hopping on the podcast, bro. It's been a real pleasure. I knew a little bit about you, didn't know about the rodeo days, and everybody that's listening or watching didn't know about the rodeo days, so that's going to be definitely a treat for everybody that tunes into the League Talk podcast with this episode, uh, having Taylor Hearn on. But, but man, five. I got five questions for you before I let you go. And uh, before that, before that, man, I want to shout out Omar Washington, man. Uh, somebody we've been knowing for a long time. Uh, he's helped you along the way in your career. He's definitely helped me uh, 
a couple times when I was out here in Dallas in all seasons with some mechanics and stuff like that. So shout out all my Washington, man. Hopefully you tune into the, to the league talk podcast and you catch the episodes that I've put out so far, but we're going to hop into these five questions, man. Some, some simple answers, nothing crazy. And then I'm gonna let you go, bro. So, uh, I'm ready to shoot them out there. If you're ready to answer. Yeah, let's go. All right. So first one, man, you have any pregame rituals or routines, superstitions, however you want to, Want to want to want to put it? I guess I guess I mean I don't really have any like crazy rituals. I mean the only thing I like to do is you know read a Bible verse before I go out to play because I feel naked if I don't. So gotcha. Hey hey, we all have something, man. For me, it was music, peanut butter, and jelly sandwiches. So you know, for you, you're getting in your word. Like you said, you feel naked. Oh, for sure, for sure, music too. Yeah, for sure, the music too. I mean, I mean, man, like whenever I was starting, like whenever I get back to starting, and just like when I wasn't starting and everything, man, I I had like a, you know, always a set few songs I played all the time on my playlist, you know, because I was just about, hey, you know, getting hyped up, just my mental stuff, starting thinking, you know, what I'm saying that's when I really flipped the switch. For sure, but that that Bible verse is a game changer. I must say, I must say, that's definitely a game changer when you're talking about pregame rituals or routines or whatever. But so tell me this, man, what's something a hitter? What's something a hitter does that 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 you can't stand? Something a hitter may do that you can't stand. Um. Oh yeah. One thing that irritates me is when <laughs> I see hitters um, swinging their bat. Like when they get in the box, <clears throat> they want to swing their bat, and they yeah. always happen to be swinging their bat right where the catcher's fingers are, and I can't see all the time. So uh-huh. I'm just like praying and hope, you know what I'm saying? So that's like, one thing that irritates me. Yeah, what you yeah, doing? Exactly. Why are you trying to block my signs? <laughs> like, yeah, trying to block the signs, or or another one is like, you know, I I, and I guess they, you know, they're asking questions too, but then like I've seen it repetitively where like. I make a I make two pitches, two or three pitches, and they're always looking back to the umpire asking, like, like hey, where's where that? that? And I'm just like, <laughs> get in there and swing, dude. Like, yeah. like, my God. I'm with you on that one. That one right there, I could say I, that's something that irritates me as well. That's crazy, man. So tell me this, man. I, I can't, because, like, we, 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 we can't sit there and be like, hey, where you got that? You know what I'm saying? Because the umpire's going to tell us something. Like, come, just go ahead yeah. and do your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Although, although it's, you know, your career is young. You're young in your major league career. What's been your most memorable moment thus far, man? Getting by first big league strikeout, man. Waiting over a year Ooh. for that. Who was that? Who Finally was that? Got that. Uh, it was a slider to Daniel Vogelbach when he gotcha. was with the Mariners. Gotcha. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. First strikeout. So, two more questions for you, man. Then I'm going to let you go. Two more questions. Your favorite athlete of all time? One uh, A, one and one A. If you want, you can give me two. Okay. I can't think of one. I'll go. I'll go Michael Vick. Okay. And um, Randy Johnson. Nice, nice, nice. I thought you was gonna throw some rodeo cowboy in that thing, man. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> no rodeo. I though. got you. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. It makes sense, though. So, last thing, man. Give me a couple of goals for next season and the future for you. Um, for one, of course, have a healthy year. But um, to go into every year trying to figure out what I need to work on. But also, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that when I come into the year, every year, I'm a different guy at the end of the year. So, and, and taking it day by day, setting small goals, whether that's establishing, you know, for example, establishing fastball in more against lefties. Gotcha. Uh, you know, just small goals like that that add up to not so much bigger goals, but just like small goals like that that help get me to what I'm trying to do, whether that's me mentally trying to just say, hey, like, we get back to starting, uh, we're going to try to leave the league and, and, and strike out to the end of the year, whatever it is. You know, but it's like, hey, if, if if my goal is to, you know, for example, win a triple crown, I'm like, I got to make sure I do fastball then against lefties more often because they did that to me last year or, or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? Establishing off speed early in the count, you know, w- just whatever it is. And I feel like when you set so many small goals, 
that's going to help you achieve the bigger ones instead of me focusing on the big ones saying, okay, I need to go out here and strike all these guys out. It's like, no, yeah. I'm going to do the small stuff because that's going to add up at the end to where it's like, oh, that makes it a little bit easier to where I don't have to sit and think about striking out guys. Definitely, I got you, man. I definitely got you. It's, it's, it's you, um, I guess, keeping pace throughout the marathon because we talk about baseball being a marathon, not a sprint. So you keeping pace throughout that marathon is huge, man. And, and it's definitely, you know, something to really think about and see at the end of the day. There is light at the end of the tunnel. I can't try to just jump up and do those things. I got to take care of the small things in between so that I can ultimately build into those big things or those big accomplishments. Man, Taylor, bro, it was a pleasure. Definitely a pleasure having you on the League Talk podcast. You know, we're looking forward to some big things from you as a pitcher with the Texas Rangers or whoever else you may you may give your services to throughout your major, major league career, man. Uh, much love, bro. Continued success, man. This is the League Talk podcast. We out of here.